Welcome back to another book highlight. In this chapter, My Father the King, chapter 24, Mephi is finally faced with something that he's believed for his whole life would be the ultimate nightmare, meeting King David. Now, Ziba, his guardian, has finally told David where Mephi is, and the king has summoned him without any explanation or preparation, and Mephi panics. He has no context for the stories he's heard about his father's friendship with David, and he's sort of put himself for so long in a category of people who don't belong with David and the anointed ones. It's hard for him to believe that David would treat him like anything other than an enemy because he doesn't realize the depth of what God did between Jonathan and David. So Machir shows him the lament that David wrote for Saul and Jonathan when they died, and he basically encourages him. You know, there's something so much bigger going on here that's that's based on their old friendship. You may not feel like you can lean on that because it feels immaterial and it happened before you were born, but God established it as provision for you, and it's not based on your merit or your control. And I would encourage you to trust that God is at work and just move forward, trusting God over your own feelings and worries. Now, there are two things going on here that I want to talk about, two beautiful things. Number one, how often do we block ourselves from things God wants to give us and do for us because we're not willing to trust him? Maybe we want to trust in something we understand and we're bound by our own mindsets that we've cultivated over the years and we'd rather lean on that than see if it's even true. It's so much easier to trust what we can see over something that God has been doing behind the scenes. And the more we do that, the more our brain seeks fleshly evidence for the fact that God can't be trusted and we, we disqualify ourselves from things that God wants us to be a part of. In this novel, Mephi shuts himself out and assumes that he belongs in the category of David's enemies rather than Jonathan and the people who love David. And by all evidence, he would more likely belong with his father. He's just never really existed there or learned what that means. But now God is moving him into that, saying, you know, you've made progress and now I want to show you the fullness of what can be yours. We need to surrender any mindsets that are holding us back, destroying every lofty opinion that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, as 1 Corinthians tells us, and be led by his truth as opposed to our assumptions, even if they seem comfortable because we've been sitting in them for a while. Even if we feel like there is physical evidence for our assumptions, many times we need to step forward onto the waves before there's physical evidence for what God wants to do. Step forward in line with God's truth, even if it feels immaterial. He will lead you into its reality. You may not be able to feel completely safe and in control in God's will at all times, but it's absolutely where you belong. And if you do as scripture says and let God's truth lead your actions, we will catch up with our understanding. And that's a beautiful moment. And this is the other point. The biggest area where we are told to step forward and approach the king outside of our own merit and control and deserving, outside of things we can understand and comprehend, is the gospel itself. Mephi's life is a beautiful picture of the gospel. Mephi represents us and David represents God the Father, while Jonathan represents Jesus. We have to approach God not based on anything we've done. And likewise, you know, Mephi is nervous to approach David because he doesn't feel confident. He doesn't have anything to offer or a history or relationship. But guess who did? Jonathan. Mephi is shaky and uncertain because he doesn't bring anything with him, but he doesn't yet see what an impact Jonathan made and how David's love for him has more to do with Jonathan's merit. When we approach God, we come into salvation with Christ's finished work on our shoulders. Jesus clothes us in himself, and God looks at us seeing not what we don't bring to the table, but Christ's finished work. He sees the virtue of Christ, and he accepts us in his son's precious name. So if you ever were looking for a story that really exemplifies the gospel, this is it. Something that we step into by the virtue of what Christ has done, and something that requires us to cast off any idea of our own deserving or our own control and trust something that was done thousands of years ago for our sake.